The ancient temple was built of rough blocks of lava and was simply a roofless enclosure 130 feet long and 70 wide. Nothing but naked walls, very thick, but not much higher than a man's head. They will last for ages, no doubt, if left unmolested. Its three altars and other sacred appurtenances have crumbled and passed away years ago. It is said that in the old times thousands of human beings were slaughtered here in the presence of naked and howling savages. If these mute stones could speak, what tales they could tell. What pictures they could describe of fettered victims writhing under the knife, of masked forms straining forward out of the gloom with ferocious, ferocious faces lit up by the sacrificial fires and the background of ghostly trees of the dark pyramid of Diamond Head standing sentinel over the uncanny scene and the peaceful moon looking down upon it through rifts in the cloud rack. When Kamachuiha pronounced Kamehameha, the great, who was a sort of a Napoleon in military genius and uniform success, invaded the island of Oahu three quarters of a century ago and exterminated the army sent to oppose him and took full and final possession of the country. He searched out the dead body of the king of Oahu and those of the principal chiefs and impaled their heads on the walls of his temple. Fierce folk. Those were savage times when this old slaughterhouse was in its prime. The king and the chiefs ruled the common herd with a rod of iron, made them gather all the provisions the masters needed, built all the houses and temples, stand all the expenses of whatever kind, take kicks and cuffs for thanks, drag out lives well flavored with misery, and then suffer death for trifling offenses or yield up their lives on the sacrificial altars to purchase favors from the gods for their hard rulers. Oh, gosh. The missionaries have clothed them, educated them, broken up the tyrannous authority of their chiefs, and given them freedom and the right to enjoy whatever their hands and brains produce with equal laws for all and punishment for all alike who transgress them. The contrast is so strong. The benefit conferred upon this people by the missionaries is so prominent, so palpable, and so unquestionable. The frankest compliment that I can pay them, and the best is simply to point to the condition of the Sandwich Islanders of Captain Cook's time and their condition today. Their work speaks for itself. Chapter 65, Interesting Mementos and Relics, An Old Legend of a Frightful Leap, An Appreciative Horse, Horse Jockeys and Their Brothers, A New Trick, A Hay Merchant, Good Country for Horse Lovers. By and by, after a rugged climb, we halted on the summit of a hill, which commanded a far-reaching view. The moon rose and flooded mountain and valley and ocean with a mellow radiance, and out of the shadows of the foil foliage, the distant lights of Honolulu glinted like an encampment of fireflies. The air was heavy with the fragrance of flowers. The halt was brief. Gaily laughing and talking, the party galloped on. 
and I clung to the pommel and cantered after. Presently we came to a place where no grass grew, a wide expanse of deep sand. They said it was an old battleground. All around, everywhere, not three feet apart, the bleached bones of men gleamed white in the moonlight. We picked up a lot of them for mementos. I got quite a number of arm bones and leg bones, of great chiefs, maybe, who had fought savagely in that fearful battle in the old days, when blood flowed like wine where we now stood, and wore the choicest of them out on Oahu afterward, trying to make them go him go. All sorts of bones could be found except skulls, but a citizen said irrever irreverently that there had been an unusual number of skull hunters there lately. A species of sportsmen I have never I had never heard of before. Nothing whatever is known about this place. Its story is a secret that will never be revealed. The oldest natives make no pretense of being possessed of its history. They say these bones were here when they were children. They were here when their grandfathers were children. But how they came here, they can only conjecture. Many people believe this spot to be an ancient battleground. And it, and it is usual to call it so. And they believe that these skeletons have lain for ages, just where their proprietors fell in the great fight. Other people believe that Kamuhamadha, <laughs> the first, <laughs> fought his first battle here. On this point, I have heard a story, which may have been taken from one of the numerous books which have been written concerning these islands. I do not know where the narrator got it. He said that when Kamahameha, who was at first merely a subordinate chief on the island of Hawaii, landed here, he brought a large army with him and encamped at Waikiki. The Oahans marched against him, and so confident were they of success that they readily acceded, acceded to a demand of their priests that they should draw a line where their bones now lie and take an oath that, if forced to retreat at all, they would never retreat beyond this boundary. The priest told them that death and everlasting punishment would overtake any who violated the oath, and the march was resumed. Kamehamehade ha, <laughs> ah, drove them back step by step. The priests fought in the front rank and exhorted them both by voice and inspiriting example to remember their oath to die if need be but never crossed the fatal line. The struggle was manfully maintained, but at last the chief priest fell, pierced to the heart with a spear, and the unlucky omen fell like a blight upon the brave souls at his back. With a triumphant shout, the invaders pressed forward. The line was crossed. The offended gods deserted to the despairing army and accepting the doom their perjury had brought upon them, they broke and fled over the plain where Honolulu stands now, up the beautiful Nauna Valley, paused a moment, hemmed in by precipitous mountains on either hand, and the frightful precipice of the Pari in front, and then were driven over a sheer plunge of 600 feet. The story is pretty enough, but Mr. Jarvis's excellent history says the Owalans were entrenched in Nauna Valley, that Kamahumaha ousted them, routed them, 
pursued them up the valley and drove them over the precipice. He makes no mention of our boneyard at all in his book. Impressed by the profound silence and repose that rested over the beautiful landscape and being, as usual, in the rear, I gave voice to my thoughts, I said. What a picture is here, slumbering in the solemn glory of the moon. How strong the rugged outlines of the dead volcano stand out against the clear sky. What a snowy fringe marks the bursting of the surf over the long curved reef. How calmly the dim city sleeps yonder in the plain. How soft the shadows lie upon the stately mountains that border the dream-haunted Muawa Valley. What a grand pyramid of billowy clouds towers above the storied Pari. How the grim warriors of the past seem flocking in ghostly squadrons, squadrons to their ancient battlefield again. How the wails of the dying well up from the at this point the horse called Huahu sat down in the sand. Sat down to listen, I suppose. Never mind what he heard. I stopped apostrophizing and convinced him that I was not a man to allow contempt of court on the part of a horse. I broke the backbone of a chief over his rump and set out to join the cavalcade again. Very considerably fagged out, we arrived in town at nine o'clock at night, myself in the lead. For when my horse finally came to understand that he was homeward bound and hadn't far to go, he turned his attention strictly to business. This is a good time to drop in a paragraph of information. There is no regular livery stable in Honolulu or indeed in any part of the kingdom of Hawaii. Therefore, unless you are acquainted with wealthy residents who all have good horses, you must hire animals of the wretchedest description from the Kanakas, i.e. natives. Any horse you hire, even though it be from a white man, is not often of much account because it will be brought in for you from some ranch and has necessarily been leading a hard life. If the Kanakas, who have been caring for him, inveterate riders they are, have not ridden him half to death every day by themselves, you can depend upon it that they have been doing the same thing by proxy, by clandestinely, clandestin clandestinely hiring him out. At least so I am informed. The result is that no horse has a chance to eat, drink, rest, recuperate, or look well or feel well, and so strangers go about the islands mounted as I was today.